Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Diane, very much for inviting me. Um, this is a film I value very much, and I want to try and say a few words to uh, evoke how, uh, how much it means to me. Um, I've, I've been uh, thinking a lot about quite how to introduce it. And I am someone who uh, doesn't believe that spoilers matter. But in this case, I actually think spoilers matter. And there's a strange way in which a film which is quite as experimental, quite as daring, quite as unusual as uh, Jeanne Dielman actually has a deep tension built into its whole structure. And the narrative development is, to my mind, very important. Also, I'd say it's a film in which the first time you see it and all the subsequent times you see it are different. Uh, in that sense, uh, the first viewing has to, in, in a way, incorporate that uh, tension, that anxiety about what is actually going to happen uh, over the course of this very, very long film. And then after that, once one knows, uh, then one watches the film, I think, in very, very different ways in the future. And the details of the film emerge on subsequent viewings, really like the texture of a tapestry, which is a metaphor that I'm going to employ uh, a couple of times. Now, I want to start with a massive uh, generalization and say that whether Chantal Ackermann would like it or not, and she always resisted the categorization of her work uh, as feminist and as feminist cinema, whether she would like it or not, Chantal Ackerman undoubtedly created a women's cinema. And as she created, uh, as she filmed women's, women's and, a woman, women, and a woman's way of envisaging and exploring the world, she turned the cinema upside down. She shows stories and images of a kind which had never really been shown or had been told uh, before. Um, her cinema, and I think this is encapsulated by Jean Dielman, is what I think of as a dauntless cinema. There's a level of courage uh, in the way in which this film is constructed. And this is partly to do with its length, but it's partly to do with the way in which it was filmed. Um, I want to say uh, just very briefly a little bit about uh, Ackermann's background. Um, she was born in 1950. She died in uh, 2015. Um, her uh, she, her family was originally for, uh, Jewish from Poland, and her maternal grandparents uh, perished uh, in the Holocaust, and her, and her mother was an Auschwitz survivor. And her mother and her relationship was one of special closeness throughout the whole uh, lives. Um, um, she describes her first encounter with cinema, uh, or her first encounter with a passion for cinema, as seeing uh, Jean-Luc Godard's film, Pierrot le Fou. And she felt when she saw Pierrot that her future would lie with film and as a filmmaker. Um, she uh, made a very remarkable short called Sot Ma Ville um, as a teenager. And then quite soon after that, 
uh, left Brussels and went to New York, where she encountered the new American cinema, structuralist film, and uh, met uh, the French cinematographer Babette Mongold, who would later film uh, Jeanne Dielman after working with her on uh, several projects. Now, Jeanne Dielman, um, a film just under three hours long, is what people might today call a challenge. And when it was first shown in Cannes in the director's fortnight, it was definitely taken to be a challenge. And Ackerman has described sitting at the back of the cinema with Delphine Seyrig as they listened to the seats clattering and banging as the cinema gradually emptied of its audience. I hope this won't happen tonight. Uh, but she then describes... The next day, 50 people invited the film to festivals, and I traveled with it all over the world. The next day, I was on the map as a filmmaker, but not just any filmmaker. At the age of 25, I was given to understand that I was a great filmmaker. It was pleasing, of course, but also troubling, because I wondered how I could do better, and I don't know if I have. Um, I think that's a very telling little aside, I don't know if I have, because there's something very remarkable about the film Jean Dielman and the films that Ackerman was making just around and about them, as uh, they're films that come out of her, her imagination, her extraordinary skill with cinematic, with the language of film, but also, I think, are actually generated, gets a particular energy out of being made at the time of the women's movement and being part of a movement and have a consciousness uh, of a special relationship to their historical, to its historical uh, moment. So in a sense, I would say it's uh, a great work of Ackermann's art but it also transcends the individual and touches on something which is actually of its historical time, but also of universal interest and uh, relevance. Now, I just wanted to say very quickly that I saw the film for the first time at the Edinburgh Film Festival in 1976. Uh, it was a festival crammed with gems of avant-garde film, a new film by Michael Snow, films by Strauss Huillet, uh, and so on. But in this very kind of rich company, Jean Dielman stood out. It was the film of the festival, it was the enigma of the festival. And I remember thinking, retrospectively, of course, that just as there was a before and after Citizen Kane, there was a before and after of uh, Jeanne Dielman. It was, in a sense, quite a, a landmark, uh, and a landmark uh, experience. Um, now, I don't want to say too much about, uh, about the film, but I want to introduce uh, a couple of um, specific points about its aesthetics. So without giving any, uh, anything away, just a couple of um, perhaps um, 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 things to look for, things to think about. Um, first of all, throughout the film, language is difficult. There's a lack of speech, and when speech does come, it comes with difficulty. So the film relates very closely to questions of women's silence, the silence of women as trivialized, marginalized, but also the silence of the difficulty of the mother, uh, the mother's position, as it were, as close to the child, close iconically, to that relationship, and once separated from the intimacy of the mother-child bond, relegated, as it were, to a special kind of silence. Um, and then uh, there's uh, um, um, 
also the relationship between women and sexuality and the kind of repression and silence uh, that surrounds that realm, that world, which is very significant for Jeanne, uh, for the film uh, Jeanne Dielman. So the film explores women's domestic labor, women's sexuality, uh, women and the unconscious. And women and domestic labor, um, Ackermann insists on taking the gestures of, uh, of uh, domesticity seriously and taking them out of a kind of underworld of non-existence and giving them a place, as it were, within uh, culture. And this is an, uh, also a way of giving a voice to silence. So throughout the film, where speech is difficult, cinema itself, as it were, offers another register of signification. And the gestures of the central figure, Jean Dielman, also register another level of signification. But also I want to emphasize very particularly the temporality of the film. It takes place over three days, and there's a central turning point at the beginning. And whereas the first part of the film establishes, as it were, a kind of harmony of time and space, a harmony between Jeanne's activities and her interiority, at, in, at a certain pivot point in the film, things begin to fall out of kilter, which then, uh, uh, then occupies the rest of the film in a sense, in a symmetrical relationship, but one of opposition. The harmony and order of the first part uh, is succeeded by a disharmony. So that's the three uh, days which make up a very highly structured uh, narrative. Um, secondly, there's the gestural time, what we might think of as the real time to go back to the a point that I made just earlier, the way that Ackermann insists on giving the gestures of cooking and domestic life an actual time, so that we see Jeanne preparing meals in the time it actually took Delphine Seyrig to knead the, meat, uh, the meatloaf, to prepare the uh, veal cutlets, uh, and so on. So this is a real time that makes a gesture to the importance of the culture of the domestic, but also it's a real time that begins to fuse with the cinematic. We're not necessarily used to seeing on the screen very long and extended chunks of film. We're used to seeing them cut up by po different points of view, uh, different ways of examining a scene. But Ackermann's dauntless, as I said before, uh, camera insists on holding the actual time itself. And this brings one back, as the spectator, to actually, as it were, watching the passing of cinematic time as well as watching the actual events that are taking place on the screen. So this <coughs> is, in a sense, an experience of spectatorship. And so rather than feeling a kind of um, um, irritation at the length of the, uh, of the scene, it's important to just think about cinema's relationship to time and its passing. Um, and then to go back to the question of texture, the kind of emptiness of the, uh, of the lack of speech, the lack of event, that we're so unused to on film, where a major event <coughs> can be the peeling of potatoes, <coughs> what we find is a kind of texture in which the figure of Delphine <coughs> Sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm <coughs> coughing, getting carried away. Anyway, I've got to stop in a minute, so I'm just finishing off. The way in which the figure of Delphine Seyrig 
<coughs> her, um, her particular elegance and the way that she conveys Jeanne's double sense, her, Jeanne's sexual sense and her respectable maternal sense becomes in a sense, it becomes a kind of tapestry which then merges once again with the cinematic uh, image. I think it's a very Freudian film. Again, I'm not sure if Ackerman would like me to say this. For a short time, she was involved with a group called Psychoanalyse Politique uh, in the early 70s in Paris. And I think that this is a film which is really kind of driven by power praxis, by um, um, uh, slips of the unconscious. It's driven by the repression of uh, Jeanne's sexuality. And in a way, it's a film that opens up, almost unlike any other, the spectator's experience, the spectator to the experience of an unconscious, which is at one and the same time the unconscious of our protagonist, Jeanne Dielman, but also relates much more generally and much more universally to questions of the oppression of women and how, when that oppression actually finds an image on the screen, silence is beginning to break. I'll stop.